Um, for those of you who were here last month, or if you didn't get to see it, we held a candidate forum with the candidates running for the 10th district of the U.S. House of Representatives. The video of that is available online. We'll probably be reposting that over the weekend, just before the election here. Um, hopefully, if we get good sound tonight and the video, we will also post tonight's forum. Um, we have a couple candidates who said they were going to be here who haven't shown up yet. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute because they might show up in the meantime. But uh, to get us started, if uh, you could stand for the invocation, gentlemen, if you remove your hats, I'd appreciate it. Holy Father, we thank you for this country, and we thank you for the freedom that you've given us. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us in this generation to pass those same freedoms on to future generations. There are good people running in these races, Lord. I pray that you'd give everyone discernment in knowing how best to choose. We pray that you'd bless everyone who's running, bless their families. We pray that you would bless Michigan and the United States of America. And I pray that you'd be with everyone here tonight. Help them to be able to focus and say what needs to be said. We pray that you bless, and I pray, Lord, for those who are going through hardships right now. I know that Doug Dudek, a lot of people know him here, is having trouble. And I pray for Gary Eisen's extended family who are having some difficult times right now. We pray that you bless them, heal them. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The U.S. flag is over here. If you go ahead with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you go ahead and be seated, a couple housekeeping items. I am going to have um, our Vice Chairman Joe Ellis pass around the donation bucket. Donations are not required. If you want to make a small donation, you're welcome to do so. Um, for those who if you were here last month or you saw the video online, Blue Water Tea Party gave out an education scholarship last month to a student from St. Clair County for $500. He's attending U of M. Um, those kind of things don't happen uh, by us pulling money out of our own wallets. Everybody contributed to that. I want to thank you for that. And if Joe, if you want to, I'll just go ahead and set this over here and start passing that. Thank you. Um, Joe's tied up right now passing out cards. Please be sure to get a card or two or more. Um, if you need more cards to write down a question for our candidates, just raise your hand and we can get cards to you. When you have a question ready, if you could just hold it up for us, Joe and I will be going around and collecting those, and we'll be handing them to the moderator tonight so that he can ask the candidates questions. We have um, no meeting in August. I want to be sure everybody knows that. We do not have a regular meeting in August. And there will be details coming out in our regular emails uh, about a meeting in September. It's looking like it's going to be September 16th, was a, which is a Friday night, which is odd for us. That is still up in the air. We have a speaker possibly coming into Florida for that event. More details on that later. Um, Blue Water Tea Party is nonpartisan and nonprofit. And, uh, and tonight, it's a testimony to that. If the Democrat actually shows up in the 83rd District, it's race. He said he's going to be here. Hopefully, he'll still make it. Um, we'll see about that. We also strive to be as unbiased as possible, and that is why I'm not moderating tonight, because I'm heavily involved in this race, and I would not be fair asking questions. And I want to thank Bill DeVette from Lapeer County Tea Party, who's agreed to come here again tonight to moderate tonight's event. And um, he's going to explain the ground rules for the forum tonight. We are videotaping it, and like I said, hopefully if we get a, a good recording here, that will go up online this weekend. Uh, along with the 10th District Race, again, we'll post that on the Blue Water Tea Party Facebook page, look for that, and then on bluewaterteaparty.com as well. Um, Bill, is, we, like I said, we have the three races. We have a county commissioner's race, and out of the two people running, Gary Eisen is here tonight. He's challenging the seat that's currently held by Jeff Baum, chairman of the uh, Board of Commissioners for St. Clair County. After that, we were gonna separate a forum between the two districts in the 32nd District, and the 83rd district. However, at this point, we have one candidate from the 32nd district. What we might do to streamline things and make the meeting go faster tonight is just have all the candidates from both 32nd and 83rd district answer the same questions. Um, that could streamline it. Unless we have um, 
The other candidate who's going to be here from the 32nd district, that's how we'll run that. We'll know as soon as Gary's done, about 10 minutes here. So um, at this point, I'm gonna turn the um, floor over to Gary Eisen, running for the county commissioners, and we'll give you about two minutes to introduce yourself, and then um, if anybody has any questions for him, we'll take that, and then we'll go on to the house races from there. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, by now, everybody knows who I am. Okay, I ran a couple times, and uh, just tell you a quick little story. First, uh, 2012, I ran for state rep, and I got a phone call one night telling me I wasn't the chosen one. Okay, and I said, well, "Why not?" And they said, "Because the Republican Party thinks you're too independent." Uh, hard to groom, you won't go with the flow, and a couple of other things. Okay? Pretty much the same stuff they're criticizing Trump about right now. Okay? I'm not a team player. Okay? I guess they're just afraid that I can think for myself, do things for myself. You know, I don't kiss anybody's butt. And, uh, you know, so that was kind of hard that night to take. You know, and I always thought the voters choose, not other people, but it was a tough night. Okay. Anyway, um, people ask me, why can you run? What, what can you offer? All right. I have many, many skills. I've been in business for 40 years. I started my business when I was 21. I'm an innovator. Leadership qualities. Uh, I've been around. Um, National champion in Taekwondo. It takes a lot of dedication to win gold, win gold medal. I won seven. Uh, plus, there's other things I can do good. Okay, I can take something as simple as this right here. Okay, this is a status quo magazine out of the 1022 Ruger. Okay, hopefully everybody knows what that is. Okay, it's been around for 40 years. This is the status quo. Okay. My, my in-laws got an accident, that might be part of that. I'll just let it so anyway, what I did is I made it better. Okay. I, had an image, I got a patent on this little white thing here that makes this better. Okay. After 40 years of status quo, I made something better. Okay. This is my quality I have. I just don't look at everything and just say, well, that's the way it should be, that's the way it always is. Okay, I look at things as to constantly improve. I constantly fix things for people. I constantly have to repair things. Okay, I'm a problem solver, not a problem talker. Okay, I'm very conservative about my ways of spending. I'm conservative on my decision making. All right? And I think sometimes it's good to mess, mess up the status quo once in a while, get some new blood in there, new ideas, you know. So that's who I am. Uh, oh, I also teach firearm classes. Good time to pull, pull it back. Okay. I have a class on the 13th and the 14th. So anybody wants to go in class? Go for it. Any questions? Do I keep talking? I use my 10 minutes up then? <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add here? No, I mean, everybody kind of already knows who I am, one of my okay. followers. Okay, so. Uh, All right, thanks for coming. Hopefully, go from there. Questions? 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 Questions?
bring it to Gary, he'll fix it. Okay? If he can't fix it, it's broken. All right? Now, it's hard to get out to let everybody know what I'm about, but gee whiz, you know, I think it, if it takes a little research, they'll find out that, you know, maybe we don't need someone that just talks and talks and talks, okay? Uh, I think you just need some problem solvers, not problem solvers. So, uh, best thing to know is people get to know me, they like me. Not everybody, but if everybody likes you, you're doing something wrong. So, uh, other than that, uh, you know, I don't know. I guess if people would just get to know me, they would they would vote for me. And I don't spin nothing. Okay, right now, there's a whole bunch of spinning going on. You know, we do this, we do that. Well, hopefully, people can see beyond that. And, uh, just mix things up a little bit, change it up. So, thank you. Gary, I'm a Gary too. Nice meeting you. Talk to my right ear because I got three bird holes in my left ear. Okay. Well, I just wanted to add on her question there. She was asking about, you know, um, if you're already opposed before you even go in. When you get in, and she mentioned about compromise, it's not that so much as that you can be textbook absolutely right. But how do you get your idea across so it sells to the group? And how, how do you bring them in? what you're saying. It's it's called uh, you gotta compromise. Okay. You gotta do some research. Another thing is I have a friend of mine who helped me get started in uh, AU Taekwondo target shooting. Okay. They asked me to be the national director for the whole 50 states to run the target shooting program. Why do they do that? Because I'm because they don't trust me? Okay. They do because they know I get the job done. Okay, another thing. He told me, never be satisfied with the answer you get. Just keep asking the question in different ways until you get the answer you want. Okay? Mm -hmm. So what you do is you keep, if you need to get something across, well, you come in from a different angle. Okay? They didn't like this way? You know, I'll come in this way and try it. Okay? Instead of so, fucking heads. Instead of fighting, which... Trust me, sometimes I feel like I, that's what needs to be done, all right? But you can't go around kicking everybody's butt. Uh, that's gets you in jail, right? <laughs> but the point is, is that if everybody would just look at different ways to do something, okay, it's, it changes their train of thought, okay? So, and it's like, it's like a three-lane highway. Okay, you got the people on the far right, people on the far left, and you got the people in the middle, okay? If you're so determined to stay in that far right lane and there's an accident, you're so stubborn that you won't go around that accident a little bit and keep moving forward, what happens? You're sitting there forever. And nothing gets solved. Okay? I can bend. Okay? I can compromise. But you know what? You still got to have a conversation. Right? And I got to point out why I think this should be this way. And, and if I get up overruled, that's so be it. That's the American way, right? But I can convince, I can work with people, very good at working at, with people. I have to work with engineers. I got to work with contractors, okay? I got to convince people that come into my shop with a certain idea and convince them they're wrong, okay? And it has to be done this way to get it done. That's pretty hard, okay? But if you do it the right way, okay, things get done. Okay? And everybody on the commission is not my enemy, all right? You know what they fear? They fear I'm going to come in there with different ideas, all right? The good old boys broke up a little bit, but I'll work with anybody, anytime. Uh, and you're not in business for 40 years if I don't compromise. Is there anybody else with one more question? Or in the interest of time, let's keep going. Thank you, Mr. Eisen, for coming out tonight. Kathy, we're going to set up just for the 83rd district. Um, just talking with, you know, the candidate from the 32nd district to keep things from being confused. He doesn't necessarily want to confuse people in his district as to who he's running against. And I think that's probably fair Aikens for the 83rd district as well. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go with the 83rd district first. 
83rd District. Yep, sorry I confused you there, Kathy. Um, and in the meantime, while Kathy is setting up the name tags there, if those three gentlemen from the 83rd District would come up and have a seat, we'll, have, uh, we'll go in order. Mr. Faber, Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Muxlow. Um, any questions you have for these candidates, write them down on uh, the cards that are there. If you need another card, let Joe or myself know. When you have a question written out, hold it up for us. While they're getting set up, I'm going to invite Bill Gavet from the Pierre County Tea Party up here. He's going to explain the ground rules for how uh, this will run tonight. And, um, and he'll take it from there. Thank you, Bill Gavet, for coming out tonight. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us here tonight. Thank you to everybody uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, a few of the ground rules are: you can't just in the, in the name of trying to keep things moving along. Try to hold. We're going to try to hold all the applause until the end. We want to get information. You guys are here to find out information. Um, there, the questions will that we, we ask that are that uh, you ask a question that can be addressed to all the candidates. Uh, questions specific to one candidate aren't really going to work. But, you can figure out how to how to make that work. If you've got candidate X wants to is, is in or want to do something, you can figure out. But you have to ask it. All, it has to be able to be addressed to all the candidates, and otherwise they won't get through. And so it, we, we do need you to do that. We're going to start out. We're going to have opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes for for the opening statement. Um, when we start to go into questions, we're going to have uh, uh, one. They'll have one minute to. To give you the answer, to give the answer, um, and at the end we're going to have a minute and a half, a ninety-second closing statement. Going along is your inevitably as these things go on, you're going to while the candidates are talking, you're going to think of something else that you want to ask. If you want to ask another question, or you need another card. Raise your hand, and we'll get to you, and we'll get you another card so we can get your question in there. Main thing is we want to get as many questions uh, asked, and we want to make sure that uh, you folks uh, give as as many. Uh, your questions as possible. So with that, um, we shall, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, and, and just so the candidates know, we've got our timekeepers right up here. At, uh, as, you, as we start out, uh, you're going you know, to have the green. At 30 seconds, you're going to have the yellow card. And when the time's up, it's red, and we are going to ask everybody to kind of stop on that mark. So, um, we will start, and we will start with uh, uh, Mr. Faber. Would you like to make your opening statement? Thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, Blue Water uh, Tea Party, for allowing me to come down to your beautiful area and uh, give you my uh, views and why I think I should be elected the 83rd. I'm, uh, I was born and raised in San Juan County. I grew up in the northern part of the county. Uh, I grew up with a single mom that was uh, rather poor and uh, probably not did not vote uh, Republican at the time, but, uh, and we were probably some of those things that I'm against now and things like that, probably some of the things that we took place in, but I, I also believe sometimes our government needs to give it a hand up, not a hand down. And I, and I seen that uh, through the through the virtues of her working hard and busting her tail and working a couple jobs and trying to raise us and give us everything that we had, that I wanted a better life for myself. I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna stay at that level. So I worked hard, I got a job when I was nine. Uh, quite frankly, I was tired of wearing my brother's clothes for, to school, so, I, I thought I, I started with a paper route and then I, I got a job in the food concession industry and traveled all over uh, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana and got to sell roasted chicken in the summertime. So kind of an odd, odd thing to do. But uh, through our course of uh, the summertime, my friend that worked with me, uh, we got talking about the National Guard and uh, my family has a long history of being veterans and he was one of those things where, hey, if you do it, I'll do it. So I'm like, yeah, not sure, but that sounds like a good idea. So. We joined uh, the Army at the age of 17. I uh, went down to lovely Fort McCollin, Alabama on my summer vacation between my junior and senior year. And, uh, you know, people ask me afterwards, well, how was your summer vacation? Well, you know, we were rolling around in mud pits and uh, things, probably a little different than what my friends were doing back at home. But uh, I never looked back, and it was, uh, it was a great time. And uh, I continued that career throughout. I started a small business. Um, most of you know that I ran for this seat uh, six years ago. I didn't typically run for a seat because I, um, I want to seek out that seat. I do it because I feel I'm a better voice than, than my opponents. And uh, two years, uh, four years ago, I was asked to run for the school or for the school board. I was asked to run for the county commission. I did that. And uh, those virtues that I think is pretty near and dear to the hearts here of the Tea Party, I've taken place uh, through the last four years and the last two years as chairman 
I, uh, one of the first things when I was in office was uh, to uh, help with uh, Second Amendment rights, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez. Yeah, I also want to uh, thank Blue Water Tea Party tonight for putting this on. I know it takes a lot of time and effort to put this on. Uh, my name is Shane Hernandez. Uh, I'm kind of pretty comfortable here. I was the chair of Blue Water Tea Party, and I resigned that position to run for this race. Um, I have a master's degree in architecture and have worked in the field for 11 years at a small business here in Port Huron. I grew up in the Crawlsville area and have been in Port Huron for 11 years. Uh, married to my wife, Renee, who's right here. Our children are at home tonight. We have two young girls. Um, but I just want to talk about core values real quick. And uh, my parents didn't come tonight, which surprised me a little bit. But uh, I, I talk a lot about my father and my mother in this race and, and how where my core values came from. Uh, I'm from a very low income uh, minority family and we have that background that's typically the Democrat background and, and my dad went by that, those things for a, a very long time and, and I always like to pick on them because I tell them, you taught me everything there is to know about conservatism, you're the one who made me a Republican, you just didn't know it. You taught me about hard work, you taught me about opportunity, you taught me about God and family, that those always come first no matter what. Um, my father worked in the fields when he was a child. He worked, they would send him to Ohio, they would send him to Texas, but he never saw himself as a victim. He saw those as the things that made him who he is, and uh, that he just took the opportunity he had and, and rolled with it. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about being low income, but the other thing, I think the other character thing that I learned from my parents is I didn't know I was low income when I was a kid until I grew up, and I look back at it now. They didn't let us know that. They never let us be victims. Uh, you can do anything in this country if you want to. So I'm sure we'll get into the issues shortly. I just wanted to give a little bit of my background. And I'm also the, uh, the vice chair of Port Huron Housing Commission. Uh, I serve as the chairman of Blue Water, or I mean, uh, the president of Port Huron First United Methodist Men and the treasurer of the Blue Water District United Methodist Men. Thank you. Mr. Muxlow. Well, good evening. Oh, sorry. Rather loud. Uh, I'm Matt Muxlow. I'm glad to be here tonight. I am a resident of San Lac County. Um, I, uh, I'm a limited government conservative, and I'll tell you what that means to me. Government's got a role in infrastructure. Government's got a role in public safety, K-12 education, and at the federal level, national defense. Beyond that, we've gotten too big. We've gotten too big, especially at the federal level. I grew up in Brown City, as I said, I attend the Missionary Church. It's the same denomination as Colonial Woods. Many people probably here attend that church. I'll be going to our camp meeting when this is done on Tuesday, which is just outside of Brown City. Uh, I grew up, uh, uh, and I, uh, growing up, I went to Brown City High School, graduated 20 years ago from there, attended Michigan State, got a business degree. A few years back, I decided I wanted to broaden my horizons a little bit, work, uh, work two jobs at night. One during the, or two job, two jobs, excuse me. I was the chief of staff in the Michigan legislature for one of the most conservative lawmakers in the state house. I take pride in that. It's okay to be a conservative and work in the legislature. That's a good thing. That's Pat Somerville from Down River. Worked a second job off nights. Why? Because I was attending law school. Wanted to minimize debt. Work hard. That's how I was brought up. Okay? Those are big undertakings. I've worked two jobs much of the last 10 years. Often. And at 1.3. I know what it's like to be through tough times. I know what it's like to be laid off. Been there. I get it. We'll talk more about issues here tonight. I thank you for allowing me to come and speak uh, to your group and look forward to what's coming up. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to start off our questioning. Now, we're going to start off our questioning and we're going to rotate uh, the questions. So we'll, we'll start, start uh, uh, again with uh, Mr. Faber. And then the next question will go to Mr. Hernandez. And then the next question and so on. So we'll rotate through. So the first question is, how is your background going to be an asset, an asset to the state representative's position? And how will, how will it be helpful with the responsibilities uh, and legislation that you might have to work on as a legislator? Sure. First of all, you can call me Justin. You don't have to call me Mr. Faber. But uh, uh, my background is a little bit different than, than most here. It, um, I have. Uh, I've been a whole elected office. I've uh, answered to my voters. I've uh, those those virtues that I think that are important to, to the Tea Party, the Republican Party, pro-life, Second Amendment, constitutional restraints. I, I've exercised those. My first week in office, I got a call from a constituent that said, 
uh, some of your buildings at the courthouse are, are legally posted and you can't bring uh, CCW permits and uh, things like that, uh, holders. So I, uh, she had been trying for over a year to get these, these things off the courthouse uh, grounds, uh, the buildings that you should be allowed to carry them in. And I, and I fought hard and we did get those taken down. Now this, this person had been trying for a number of years to get it done. So in the first week in office we got that done. The health department was going to take over the um, doing the uh, uh, stuff from the uh, hospital that was, uh, of course, against what I figured, uh, pl plan B and uh, things like that uh, after, after morning after pill. And I don't think that's the government's role. So, I've, again, I fought hard uh, to make sure that our county government was not using our funds for that. And I also yes, try to keep our spending in check. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Hernandez, same question. Yeah, I actually, I come from a different background. I come from the background of an activist. I, I'm normally the guy sitting on, on that side of the table, and I have been for the last four or five years. Um, so I would say the way it would be an asset to me is I've been working alongside of you. I feel the same thing that you do. I feel that the government hasn't been responsive to me. It hasn't been listening to me. Uh, and, that, and that we've been working so hard trying to keep it in check, keep spending in check, uh, to keep transparency in government. And I know your concerns because that's the side of the table I've been working from for, for years now. Um, so, yeah. Well, as a conservative who's actually worked in the legislature, uh, I have a unique advantage. I know who can be trusted there. I know who can't be trusted. Here's how it works. I've already got a $400 million savings and reform plan. We could put that toward roads, a specific plan. I come in on day one knowing these folks, knowing that I've been a resource. Hey, how does this work? They come to me. Many of them do. Okay, I'm a conservative. I want them to come to me. Reforming welfare. We've got $10 billion of our state budget that's flexible. $45 billion out of the $55 billion, it's spoken before it even gets to our legislators. That's federal money, and I'm okay if we don't spend it. It goes back. That's a good thing, right? And our school aid fund, which we as voters spoke in 1994 and said that's got to be locked away for schools. Okay, creative reforms, using welfare reform, putting real time limits on, and also reforms to our tax code that and free giveaways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next question uh, is going to go out. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, how long have you lived in the district? How long have you lived in Michigan, and why is time in the district important? I've actually never lived outside the district, and I've lived in Michigan my entire life. Uh, as I said, I was born and raised in Croswell, uh, lived there till I was 24, I believe, and or 23, I guess. I'm going on 11 years here in Port Huron now. So I've never lived outside the 83rd district, never lived outside of Michigan. I do think it's important to be from the district and uh, having a background in both portions of the district because the south part is very different than the north part of the district and, and having lived in both areas understanding the unique challenges the concerns of the constituents in those areas um, went to high school in Croswell I understand the agricultural side of things and I've worked in the uh, the architectural industry in in Port Huron for the last 11 years so I understand some of the challenges here uh, with skilled trades and things like that so yeah Michael. 26 of my 38 years I've lived uh, in the Blue Water area and when I didn't live here I was here 40 to 50 percent of the time anyway so uh, in a lot of ways I never really left but 26 years I think it is important to have contact with your district understand uh, the area I did work on a farm growing up so I do understand the agriculture and um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Let's try not to decapitate this. Better for the page. Put it in front of the page. Well, wait, I'm doing double race now. <laughs> I've lived here pretty much my whole life. Uh, as I said, my mom was a single mom, and we didn't move around a lot. And sometimes, uh, I don't know, we might have lived in Tuscola County or Huron County. I, I couldn't tell you that. I know we moved uh, quite often. I graduated from Ubley High School, which is three miles north of the, the county line. Uh, probably what's most important when I was later in life, uh, that when I did move out of the district, uh, it was to Fort McCollin, Alabama, Fort Myer, Virginia, Fort Lewis, Washington, and Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, we're going to start off uh, with uh, Ms. Muxlow. 
If you could, if you could make one change, what would it be? And I'm assuming that would be in the legislature. If you had the ability to make one change in our state government, what would it be? Which one out of the 40 can I pick from? Yeah. <laughs> the, the best, That's the one most important. Well, you. I talked to you a minute ago about the, the 55 billion misconception, okay? There's $10 billion that's flexible in that state budget. 40% of that is tied up in public assistance. Okay? We're a caring people. I believe government's role shouldn't be pushing that. I believe in churches doing that. Okay? I believe in local community, private organizations leading the way on that. At a minimum, I think we could push that to what other states are doing, Michigan is still a little more generous than the other states, kind of force the issue, help people get back to work. Today we have 90,000 jobs available in this state. They're there. They're there. I would, the welfare system, to put it simply, is what I would change. Very good. Mr. Favor. Well, there's one thing that I can change, and I spent uh, a little bit of time at the Capitol uh, meeting with folks, is that I make uh, every legislator a God-fearing, conservative uh, person at the Capitol. I think all things come from church, come from home, uh, and I think we need to have a, a good faith and a Christian, Christian background. Mr. Hernandez. If there's one thing I can change, uh, I want to talk about welfare as well, but I'm not going to talk about cutting individual welfare until we talk about the government getting out of corporate welfare. Uh, we talk about capitalism, we talk about a free market, and what we have in this country today is not a free market. And I see this new youth movement, this Bernie Sanders youth movement of all of these people who believe they're socialists, and, and it frustrates me because I think what we show them, what we tell them is conservatism and capitalism isn't really conservatism and capitalism. The state, this government, needs to get out of private business and stop competing with the small guys. <laughs> Sorry. It, it's good to go back, Mr. Favor. Uh, this, the question is, tell us the most important piece of legislation, proposal, or policy you ever advocated uh, for or against, uh, and did that, did you accomplish your goal? Sure. I, I know uh, some of my opponents will probably talk about the same one, but I think the most recent one that we can all uh, live with and talk about is the road funding. And uh, in Sandlot County, we had uh, we had public hearings. We had we invited our legislators. Paul was there. Uh, Phil was there. And uh, those two legislators came in and explained why they're uh, both on different sides of the way they were going to vote on that, but explained how they thought so. So uh, after that meeting, after I listened to all of the uh, advice from those two, uh, I went and advocated everything in my area to make sure that uh, we voted that down. Very good, Mr. Hernandez. I think that's a, a tough decision. As most people who are part of this organization know, Blue Water Tea Party spent six months fighting Proposal 1, and that is an important one. But I've always said if I run for office, I, uh, I would put life first. It, it is the most important thing. I don't understand how we can put jobs, how we can put funding ahead of life. And I, I would say that the, the most important piece I've worked on in the past is the No Taxes for Abortion uh, petition. And uh, that, that is something near and dear to my heart. Um, I don't normally tell this at, at candidate events, but my wife and I had a child who passed away after, shortly after birth. And for me to have to even think about, against my will, paying for somebody to take the life of a child when I would have done anything to keep mine, uh, that was a, a very, very important thing to work on, and we did succeed on that in Michigan. Mr. Muxley. I am a big supporter of life as well, uh, but I would say, someone who's actually worked on state legislation, right to work. That was a pivotal turnaround issue in this state. And I did have a small hand in advocating there. As you can imagine, I put some pressure on somebody you all know. You might just be in the room tonight. That was important. Job providers are here now. They're looking at Michigan that's not tied up in a heavy union contention. And that's, that's been a great thing for our state. Just look at how many people are working again. 450,000 more than just five years ago. Thank you. Next question is going to be for uh, Mr. Hernandez. Please explain uh, what you see as the role of government and education. Should it be more or less than it is now? 
and what are your thoughts uh, on bailout uh, or on the bailout of Detroit public schools? Okay, in one minute. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the role of government in education, I mean, I think we're far beyond uh, what the, the government's role. You know, I, I tell you, I, and we'll restart that. We're going to break this up. That is, education is really important. We're going to break that up into two questions. So, first, we're going to the first part of that, the role of Explain your role of uh, government education and, and should it be more or less than it is now and why? Okay. I, I don't believe the federal government should have a role in education. Uh, and I think that the state right now is micromanaging what's happening in the classroom. I believe the, that we need to return local control to education. Uh, we need to repeal Common Core curriculum. Uh, we need to get the federal government out of our education system. Uh, I do believe that the state needs to set some standards, needs to set some benchmarks. Uh, I know that the, the bill that's on the, in, in being considered in the House right now for the repeal of Common Core and replacement of Massachusetts state standards is something that I support strongly. It's something that gives flexibility to uh, to local districts to opt out of the program and, and to do their own thing and, and to set the, a curriculum that meets the needs of their local area. Thank you. Mr. Muxlow. Yes. Um, please explain what you see as the role of government in education, and I'm assuming that means our state government, and should it be more or less than it is now? I'd like to see the federal government get right out of education. They're ruining our schools with Common Core. Horrible. Horrible. You know, looking at some math problems with my 11-year-old nephew a year and a half ago, um, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. The new way to do a division and having to tell a story almost, just doing a basic math problem, is, is incredible. I think it's appalling. I think our state years ago used to let our locals do more. Today they are micromanaging. I trust Tim Keller. Are you still teaching, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I trust Tim Keller. I trust local local control um, yeah, in in the educational system. And you have a second part of that. I'm sorry. Well, this we're just doing. Okay. All right. All right. And we're going to go to Mr. Faber. Not many people trust Tim Keller. <laughs> I trust you, Tim. Vote on Tuesday, please. But it, uh, I, I think hopefully all of us agree that we're, we're against Common Core. I think that the federal government should be, and you can uh, follow the history of why and things to that extent. But the one thing I, I agree with Shane, that we need to set benchmarks and we need to say well, this is where we need to, to get to. But I think one thing that we're missing is the vocational education that we kind of fell by the wayside on. I'm a product of that. I went to, uh, I wanted to go to welding class, but I ended up in hang mechanics, and uh, which put me into a career of heating and cooling and, and plumbing. Uh, had it not been for that, I, I don't know. I would have been. Uh, I always joked that I had two goals when I graduated from high school, and that was to chew tobacco and, and uh, work at General Motors. I failed at both, but uh, so sometimes God has a different plan for us. But thank you. Okay, Mr. Hernandez, what are your thoughts on the bailout of Detroit Public Schools? Um, and would you and why? Explain your answer. Why do you support? Why don't you support? Well, I think it's an extremely complicated matter. Uh, what I've seen, I don't think we've fixed the problem. That's the thing. We've we put a lot of money toward it, but I don't necessarily think we've gotten to the root of the problem. We've found, what was it, 18 administrators who were taking money out of the program. I think that the, the corruption goes far, far deeper than that. I think that we needed to have a deeper forensic audit into what's going on in that school system before we give them money and, and just write a check, because I believe in a few years we're going to be right back in the same place. Uh, I do think it's a, a, a tough issue, though, because um, those kids deserve a quality education. So I, I just, with what was done, I wouldn't have thrown the money at it that we did without more, I guess, skin in the game from, from DPS, more investigation into what really happened and where it broke down. Mr. Maxwell. Just a, on a side note, uh, when you deal with things of the, this nature, there is often much, much, much more. It's not black and white, okay? Key, one key issue beyond the corruption, which as a, just a simple math portion of it, was about two to three percent of the total problem. The real problem, they lost a ton of kids, or 160,000 kids in that school district, I think 11 years ago. Today there's 46. You plan for a 7% reduction, you get 12. All the parents who cared about their kids, they left. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. 
folks are being held accountable. Yes, you have to have a balance of having something available for kids and a balance of keeping an eye on. Uh, I think this plan was pretty fair that was put together. Uh, these folks need to be prosecuted. No question about it, they are going to be prosecuted. But it's a tough, tough road to hold. But here's the, here's the point that a lot of people miss. Do you know who has to eat that debt if that school goes bankrupt? I mean, I'd like to see it just personally. I wish it could just go away, start over, here you go, go where you want. Let the money follow the kid in Detroit. We do. A federal judge, mind you, federal governments over the state government, could put an order in and order our state to pay $3 billion right now. Right now? If we let that go under. That's a travesty. But they have the authority to do that. That's the warning that was put out. That's good. Time's Thank up. you. All right. Mr. Favor. I think you do have to hold people accountable, and the supervisors, teachers, whoever it may be. I mean, we all should be following the rules and do as, do as we such. Uh, at the county, you know, we're kind of used to working with people and putting the good faith of, uh, and credit of the, of the taxpayers. Uh, we're doing that with the Worth Township Sewer Project. We've done it with the Forester Project. So we've done that with uh, other uh, entities throughout the county. So I get that that's, uh, the, the state is responsible. But I think as you're doling out this money to bail them out, I think you need to put strings attached. The one thing the government's good at is putting strings attached. So you got to make sure that they're going to be prudent in the future and they're doing following down a better path and the right path. Thank you. Next question, we're going to start. Uh, uh, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Muxlow. Okay. Governor Snyder urged the voters of Michigan to vote for Proposal One the gas tax, and the voters rejected it, 80% against and 20% for. He urges the legislature to pass it anyway. How would you stand up to the governor, to Governor Snyder, if and when he ignores the will of the people? On that particular issue, or on any issue? I'm assuming any issue. It, you know, there's an old saying: if it's if it's right, and nobody's doing it. It's still right if it's wrong, and everybody's doing it. It's still wrong. If I don't agree with Rick Snyder, I'm going to tell him no, and I don't care if he's angry with me or not. I don't care if he's cursing under his breath on the way back to Ann Arbor at, at, at night. I'll work with the man. I'll do what I can to, to find compromise, but if I can't get there, I'll just help. Sorry, sorry, sir. Now, I know I've heard some stories. He gets a little red-faced and pointed fingers. You know, we'll do the best we can, but if the answer is no, it's no, period. I have no problem looking him in the eye and telling him that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paper. Well, I think the key thing is I can't get to Rick Schneider unless if it doesn't pass the House and, uh, and of course, the Senate. So I think uh, we need good leaders in the House. And again, I have a long history of working with my fellow uh, fellow uh, office holders and to make sure we get things done correctly. Uh, and that's where, like I said, you need good leaders that can have a proven history of being able to get things done. I think it's ludicrous that they even pass the House to get to there. We all claim to be conservatives, but it doesn't show to be too true on that uh, vote there. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez. Uh, I agree with a lot of what's said. I, I think bad legislation is bad legislation. I, I, I'll look past my party on those issues. And if you hear too often, well, and, and I heard it on Prop 1 a lot of times, that, well, that was the Republican governor and your Republican reps that put that on the ballot. Well, it's wrong. And uh, I don't mind standing up against that. I, I'll keep, a, I don't ruin relationships and burn bridges. I'll keep the relationship there to work on the next issue. But when it's wrong, it's wrong. And that, that was a $2 billion tax increase that, uh, not much of it actually went to roads. There was all kinds of uh, special interests tied into that issue, and I'd stand up to it. I, we, we did that here locally. Thank you. Next question is going to go to, uh, and this will be the last question before we go to closing remarks. Um, Mr. Favor, by what groups have you been endorsed, and do you think endorsements are valuable? Sure. Well, I think that. That question is for the voters if they're valuable. Um, I've been endorsed by the Right to Life, as, as all of us have, and uh, of course, a stamp of approval for Small Business uh, Association of Michigan. Um, one, of, one of the things that I look at endorsements and the candidates you know you get about 100 questionnaires in the mail, and you got to fill these things out. Now, they only endorse you if you agree 100% with the way they are. There's a lot of topics out there, and a lot of questionnaires, when I fill them out, I put there, you know, this is the information I have at this time. And, you know, that stuff changes tomorrow. So, 
Uh, some issues, I, you know, I'm not going to side with you on, and I've seen this in public office already. I've had people that have supported me to get to be a county commissioner. I got there, and I didn't do what they asked. Well, you know, they, they, they bail on you, or they try to hold you to, to accountable because they helped you get there. So, and you're going to see that in Lansing. Uh, I'm probably the candidate that has the least amount of uh, support from Lansing and from the from the people in the, uh, on that end of the token. But uh, so I'm kind of proud of that. Uh, I believe that uh, we've raised our hard our money from hard-earned taxpayers and myself and. Uh, we're going to put that to good work and be victorious on August 2nd. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez. Yeah, I've been endorsed by Michigan Right to Life, and I believe all three of us have, which is an important endorsement to all three of us, I'm sure. Uh, have a AQ rating, I think they call it, with the NRA for people who don't serve in office, they put the Q on it. Um, Michigan Chamber of Commerce has endorsed me. I have this uh, stamp of approval from the Small Business Association of Michigan. The most important endorsements to me are, uh, you know, I, I spent my, the months of February and March meeting with agriculture people in uh, Sand Lake County. I have endorsements from over 35 farmers in Sand Lake and St. Clair counties. Uh, I have endorsements from dozens of delegates. Those are the important endorsements for me because those are the people I've been working with alongside of for the last uh, five years. Thank you. Mr. Munsell. I had to get my list out. Sorry. Um, my $400 million road plan was the reason the County Road Association of Michigan endorsed me. I've been endorsed by the Association of Builders and Contractors. I came out early, offered to be a, a big support, not only behind the scenes now, but later, and the prevailing wage repeal. By the way, found out the other day that marked up process had cost one of our school districts $100,000. That's a shame. Uh, right to life, school administrators pack, because I've, I've shown a leadership for finding a efficiency and trying to be more effective at paying down pension debt in our school pension system. I'm the preferred candidate of the auto dealers. I do have a small business stamp of approval uh, and I'm also endorsed, I think and Justin is as well, by the uh, Michigan Retailers Association as a friend of retail. Um, if I miss something, my goodness, uh, I think I got them all, but uh, I think the most important endorsement is on Tuesday from the people. I've got good ag support up in Santa Lac County as well. Thank you and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're, this time uh, we're going we're gonna to go to uh, closing statements. Now we are, uh, we, we do have a little more time. We are going to increase. We're going to give each candidate three minutes. Uh, we started uh, at that end, so we're going to reverse that. We can all, for everybody fair. So we're going to start with Mr. Muxlow. You've got three minutes. And tell, us, uh, tell us everything we need to know. Well, thank you very much for having me here tonight. You get six years as a limit in Lansing as a state rep. I hate to tell you this, it takes two to three years to learn that job. The good news is, I'm a conservative and I don't need those two to three years. I've got a very specific plan ready to go. MattMuxlow.com backslash issues. I've got a seven point reform plan. Dealing with savings for roads. Reforming welfare. Cutting the corporate income tax so we can attract more jobs here. I'll go across state lines to find jobs. MEDC, they're supposed to be a job attraction organization. I don't want to find out later that somebody was looking at Michigan and they decided to go elsewhere. Hey, let me know. Ask them if they're lawmaker or, you know, if they want to talk to a lawmaker, where are they at? Well, they're in Miami, Florida. I'll get in my car and drive there. We want your jobs in Michigan. We've got a lot of folks who are ready, willing, and able to work. Those are some of the things I want to do differently, thinking outside the box. I'm ready to go, day one. The experience is there. It takes years to learn your way around. I've been there. I've fought for you already. And that time is invaluable. I've led the most conservative office in the House of Representatives the last five years. We're proud of that. We're proud of that. Corporate welfare, you know, my nudge is every day, don't vote for that stuff. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't worry, I won't. Okay? I'm running on my own background, my own record, not somebody else's. I've heard a lot of that on the street. Did you know? Yeah, I heard it. No, look at my background. Okay? Check it out tonight, mattmuxlow.com. See more about what I stand for. Let yourself decide this election on Tuesday, not what somebody else is saying, not some assumptions, not rhetoric. You're getting my mail. I'm being specific with what I stand for. 
I'm about paying down debt. Five years ago, we were 55% funded in our school pension system. We were going bankrupt. That would hurt you, Tim. Today, that's secure. Changes are made. Today, Michigan's pension system for their teachers, for the younger teachers, is one of the leanest in the United States. It's getting national recognition, but we have a tab to pay from the inadequate payments that hadn't been made for 20 years. I want to pay that down. And then get out of the way of the schools. Let local control have it. Too much micromanaging out of land said, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Way too much out of Washington. Way too much. So those are some of the things I want to work for. Check out my plan tonight. Got any questions? My email's on there. Call me. Email you. me, whatever you'd like. Thanks. Thanks. Next up is Mr. Hernandez. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I look outside and it looks like a beautiful day out there. There's probably places we'd rather be. I also want to thank Blue Water Tea Party again for putting us on and organizing it. Blue Water Tea Party wouldn't be here if we thought our government was listening to us and acting for us and working for us. Blue Water Tea Party is here because we feel like there's a group of us that aren't listened to and we, and we need some representation. I've been going to the doors with a different message. Uh, and I have a comment that I've been making that raises some eyebrows sometimes, that I'm running for a job I don't want. I don't really want to work in Lansing. I do what I love to do right now. But as one of you guys, I've seen a government that doesn't always listen to me. And believe me, I, I have, my office is crazy right now. We have a ton of work. I have two children. I have a wife. There's things I would rather do. But I've watched the state budget go up $8 billion in six years. And it's time for something different. It's time for some, a change. And it bothers me when a master's degree, 11 years experience in small business, uh, time spent on a uh, port here in housing board and things like that isn't enough experience. We had average people found this country. We had average people write the best document that's ever been written. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, they're amazing documents. Those guys didn't have it. They were, they were farmers, they were merchants, they were shop owners, they were, and uh, today we've, we've gone so far away from that. There's an Alexander Hamilton quote from 1787, I'm not, I don't know the exact quote, but I'll give the, the basic of it, basis of it. And he said that, just think about this, 1787 he said this, that he thought he would see the day where laws got so complicated and so long that the average person wouldn't even pay attention anymore. They wouldn't have a clue what it even said. And now here we are today. So I have a track record of, of working as hard as I can. I became chairman of St. Clair County Republican Party after having attended probably two meetings. I ran my own, the first convention, and I've never even seen a convention before. I will do all of the homework necessary. I will outwork everybody else. That is how I do things. Um, so, but I look at this as it, it's a position of a public servant. It isn't a job. Uh, I'm the only person out here that I know of on this panel that's talked about making this a part-time legislature. I think we would draw better candidates. I think we'd have a, a better situation in Lansing. I do think you would have to talk about term limits and things like that if we were to do part-time legislature. But we need to bring this back, this job back to the people, or this position back to the people. Uh, so. I think that I am a, a clearly different option and vote for Shane on August 2nd and I thank everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you. And we're going to follow up with uh, Mr. Faber, please. So the best for last. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for coming tonight and thank you for the moderator and the tea party and, and thank you for my opponents for uh, uh, making sure we make this a clean and, and honest race. I think uh, it's been a great opportunity. and. Uh, you know, only in America can uh, somebody with my background and Shane's background have this privilege of being able to run for office. Uh, most countries wouldn't be allowed to do that. And uh, those of us that have served in the military have seen those places. And uh, quite, uh, I'm quite, uh, thank God that uh, we're given those opportunities. I, I know the, a lot of folks in the Blue Water area, and especially those in our, in our Republican Party, have felt left down, left out by our, by our representative. And I'm here to tell you that uh, I will be your voice. I will make sure that I'm doing as you ask me to do. And when it comes down to these things, I, you know, it's, it's great that everybody's here and they're listening to the candidates, but go a step further. Look at our campaign finance forms, go online. They're easy to watch and follow the money sometimes. You heard her here tonight, you know, we talked about uh, 
roads and, and proposal one and the county road association endorsing one candidate they were a very big proponent of proposal one they wanted that passed so again follow the money on some of these things see where see where they go uh, i have always uh, one thing that i've always done is i've always done as i said i would do when i when i ran for office uh, one of the things that i ran for county commissioner i said if there's ever a budget that the expenditures are higher than the revenues i'd vote no I had a knock on a door one time when I was running for commissioner and they said, I'm not voting for you because you spend too much money. I said, do you realize I have never voted in favor of a budget in our county yet? And I haven't to this date. Because uh, I, I ran on those issues. And so I, I, I strongly urge that is to make sure your legislators, when you get there, they're, they're doing what they said they would do when they run. I have a history of doing that. I've stood up for our gun rights. I've stood up, stood up for pro-life. And I've stood up for our constitution and the things that uh, matter most to us and keeping our budget in, in, in check. And thank you for the opportunity, and justinfavor.com. All right, folks, let's give these guys a big round of applause. Okay, thank you. I want to thank you guys. Um, and folks, remember, we appreciate everybody being here, but we appreciate these, uh, these gentlemen all taking the time to come in and take the time out of their day to let you know and just put their, their, their lives, their families, everything on hold and work for them. So, and it's something to be said that for the people that actually show up and get out to the public, those are the ones that you want to consider. Um, next, we want to give uh, some time here to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Michael Spina, and he's running in the 30s, for the 32nd state uh, representative. And uh, I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Spina. There we go. Now you can hear me. Anyway, it's kind of interesting. This kind of this this what we have here tonight. Um, I'm running on the idea that I'm part of my community. I've lived in uh, Down River area, as we call it. <laughs> I live in Iger Township. My district includes New Baltimore and Chesterfield, and then about uh, I don't know, like about a third of the uh, townships in St. Clair County are also in my and uh, I think it's important that you be a part of your community and that you show up. I uh, think it's amazing that we have this forum and there are no other people here tonight, but it really doesn't surprise me. It's kind of disappointing, but again, not surprising. Um, I'm a member down in my, uh, down in my area of the New Baltimore uh, Fish Fly Festival, Bay Rama Committee. I'm active down there with my church. I show up at uh, Lions meetings and uh, VFW halls and just the kind of things you have to do if you're going to be a representative of people. I've lived in the area for 15 years and uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually kind of blown away that, that nobody did show up. So, um, yeah, someone cares about you. That's me. Michael Tremina for State Rep. Well, we've got, uh, we would like to uh, ask questions you like. Some questions. So, uh, anybody got cards written down or any questions? If you want to use the same ones, it's yes, no, definitely <laughs> not, <laughs> maybe, and pro life all the way. Actually, I guess you know what? If, 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 how many people live in the 32nd district? Two of you and my wife. And me, obviously. So hopefully I get four votes out of this tonight. But I'd like to say that uh, one of the questions that struck me was, uh, what is the uh, one thing you would do, the first thing you would do? I'm not sure if it was first or one thing you would do. And I think it's really important that uh, really the first right that we all have is our right to life. And I would like to see Michigan become a leader in the right to life movement. I, um, I, I just, I, I've been blown away that the Supreme Court overthrew the Texas uh, laws because I thought those were critical laws that we've had here in Michigan and we, we need to, I, somebody asked me, well what would be, what would you pass? And I said, I've been running for this office for so long, I'm kind of just blown away, but I think we as a, as, a, as a state should work with the national right to life groups and come up with constitutional ideas that we can do to protect the right of life. 
another thing that just comes up with that Supreme Court thing is that I've had a lot of people talk to me about nullification. And I'm not sure if nullification per se is the answer, but I think it's high time that we as states start pushing back against the federal government and a Supreme Court that just makes decisions and forces them down the rest of us on some of the craziest decisions that you could possibly think of. The idea that, going back to the abortion thing, that an abortion clinic doesn't need to have higher hygiene standards than a dentist's office, that somehow that is, that's wrong. If, if that's wrong, then I think the rest of the country is wrong. Anybody have questions? Is anybody, do you have questions? Um, let, let me ask you a question uh, that uh, is, is so important to so many people, is the issue of Common Core. What are your thoughts on that? How do you think it should be addressed? I know our legislature um, brought it in, and it, it, somewhat now that they're bringing it back out. What are your thoughts on Common Core? I was a founding member of the St. Clair County Citizens Against Common Core three or four years ago. I've been fighting this battle before that. That was just my when I got involved in a group formally. I think that uh, almost before I even got into what Common Core was, my gut instinct was a national group and the federal government are pushing it onto states. It's wrong. I do not believe that the federal government should have any role in education except maybe some dusty little bureaucracy that collects uh, national st uh, statistics so one state can compare itself to another state. Um, what was the second part of that question? Uh, just your, your thoughts on, on Common Core and uh, well, how it should be addressed. Well, the other thing, too, is when a group of people that I saw and, and respect in, in the state came up with this idea that we're going to repeal and replace Common Core, I think we just need to repeal Common Core and kill it dead. I don't think we should replace it with another state standard, and especially not another national standard. Okay. Uh, one question that uh, was, I thought was uh, kind of interesting was, uh, um, the one about uh, what is the most important piece of legislation, proposal, or policy that you've ever advocated for or against, and did you accomplish your goal in that effort? The funny thing is, is when you ask that question to the other candidates, my note has two words, Common Core. <laughs> so I've been fighting against Common Core, and uh, whether or not I've won on that issue, is the jury, I think, is out. I think we're, I think we're winning, but just like with what I said about abortion in the Supreme Court, we have to always stay vigilant. Another issue that I've really fought hard for and where I've actually shown up and walked the walk is going right back to abortion. I've brought, uh, did a beautiful right to life uh, display with the crosses at my parish, Immaculate Conception in Anchorville. I've marched uh, three different times for defund Planned Parenthood groups. I've, uh, um, we, my wife and I have both been involved in uh, crisis pregnancy centers, so I guess it's abortion, again, going back, we're common core in abortion right now. That, that's good, very good process. Um, a question about, uh, about your district and how long you live there. Uh, kind of along those lines, um, what, because there's folks that are going to see this that may, maybe are not attending tonight, but they will be able to see this. What are your, uh, what? What are some problems or some areas that you see you could be helpful and beneficial to your district? And maybe there's some specific problems related to your district in the uh, 30 seconds. I have an interesting district, and I don't know how many people have seen it. It's interesting in a couple of different ways. We've got a little bit of Macomb County, Chesterfield, New Baltimore, and that's probably where the largest population of the district is. The uh, it's, it's on Anchor Bay, and so is Ira Township, where I live. So it's a very, it's the St. Clair, Lake St. Clair kind of a district, as far as that's concerned. And as it climbs up into St. Clair County, it actually forms the shape of a cross with uh, Ira, Casco, uh, Columbus, Kimball, Riley, and Wales, and up north, Kenoki Township. It's kind of an interesting, just the, the shape of the cross, but we have, a, we run the gamut from suburban Chesterfield Township in New Baltimore to lakefront areas that we have, and then we're very rural and agricultural district. And I think you've got to be, to be an effective uh, legislator here, you've got to be able to go back and forth from those areas down south or down district to back up north and be uh, active like I am in the 4-H and with the agriculture. 
and I'm getting a red thing here, so I guess, even though I'm not, I'm not competing against anybody, I guess I should still obey the rules. <laughs> well, that's, I appreciate that. Um, and, and again, um, another question I thought was quite, quite relevant and should be relevant to all legislators, legislators was the question about uh, the, governor's, the governor pushing Proposal 1. His, it's been a profoundly, uh, a profoundly uh, lopsided election. He was just very bent on getting this thing done. How, what are your thoughts? How would you, or what would your thoughts be on how to, how to address something, uh, an issue that maybe the governor doesn't want, uh, or, or you want, and, and the governor wants, or the governor wants, and you don't, but if you're in total, there's just no, I mean, no middle, um, what would you, uh, how, would you, how do you think you would address that? Well, I think it's important that we stick to our core principles, but, I think that you have to do you have to do disagreement in a polite way. Too many times I see it all the time on the television. It's 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 the conflict that sells the advertisement on the news. And there's times when you're going to disagree with somebody and you tell them you're I'm not going to vote for that and you walk away. Then you know don't don't give them the option of if we drop a little sweetener in it we're going to get his vote. No, it's just that's not where I'm at, so I'm not going to vote for it. Um, I found the uh, Proposal A, to, I, I was perplexed by that because it seemed to me obvious that that was not going anywhere and I couldn't believe anybody was funding support for it and I couldn't believe the governor was fighting so hard for it. I fought against that one too. Um, and frankly, I probably would have said it was an issue that I worked hard on, that I fought, that I won, but it was, it was, it was too easy, I think, as fishing in a, in a, in a barrel. So. Okay. All right, well, lastly, we've got to to kind of move towards time here, but Kim, in, in a minute, minute and a half or so, can you uh, kind, of, kind of do a wrap up? I mean, is there close here, but kind of just whatever you want to, whatever you want to do to reach out to the people that uh, again, there's a lot of people that are going to see this that aren't, couldn't be here tonight. But what would you like to say to them? Well, one of the things I would really encourage you to do is to uh, do your own research on the candidates. I think that uh, something that's critical is that. You should look at the financial reports for the candidates. Um, my, uh, I'm, I'm probably about 80% self-funded, although, as I like to tell people, I'm actually, I, I didn't put a dime into it. My, my wife funded 80% of it, and, you know, and then the rest of it, we've raised some money from here and there. Um, and, but I've got a, I'm running against an opponent who has basically got about 90% of her entire budget is from one family and a pack controlled by that same family, or a couple of packs controlled by that family. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an out of the district, Grand Rapids uh, outfit. And then we've got another guy who, I'm not sure what he's doing, but he has yet to file the reports that were due a week and a half ago, week ago, I'm not sure, Friday, I guess, so they were due a week tomorrow, I'll go tomorrow. Um, and I, I'd say you should research, because he's the fellow who said he was gonna show up. Um, <laughs> He's the fellow who said he was going to show up and didn't show up. He's uh, had a lot of things to say that have turned out to be eh, just a little bit less than 100% truthful, I'll say. Um, and, and I really encourage everybody in the 32nd District to do a bit more research than just saying, taking us all at our face value and, and using it. Because if you look at what everybody's running on in my race, I would say every one of us is running on the exact same platform. But one of us has lived the, lived the life and walked the walk for uh, over 30 years now, over 25, 30 years. I've been a businessman, small business in the state of Michigan, in my district. I've created tons, dozens and hundreds of jobs between contractors, people working directly for me and people working for contractors for me. I've never had a government job. I am not looking to just go from one government job to the next government job, and I'm getting red flagged here. <laughs> Shouldn't the red flag at this point be when everybody just walks out on me? <laughs> I, I think there's just a little bit of business to do. Yeah, we need to take care of it. Uh, okay. But uh, again, let, let's uh, let's give him a hand. <laughs> and again, just remember when you uh, when you're uh, in the ballot booth, and or if you uh, when you're making. Uh, Make your decision who to vote for. We always want to remember who it was that was, was reaching out to try to get to know you. 
uh, in the process. It's real easy to uh, uh, make a vote for somebody that you never see, but these guys are definitely they're doing the work. They're reaching out to you. So, um, again, uh, thank you guys for, for coming, and I'll turn it back over to Tim. Well, I just want to, I want to thank again the candidates for coming out tonight, taking the time to talk with us, to present, you know, where you stand. Um, I want to thank Bill Gavet and his family for uh, participating here, Bill especially for moderating, but also his daughter timekeeping and his son videotaping this. Hopefully we'll have this up on the website tomorrow at bluewatertooparty.com and on the Facebook page. And I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I hope you have a great evening. Good night.